Hi. Hi. Thank you. Silk Parachute, the book Pete just referred to, <clears throat> is a collection of ten miscellaneous pieces, each of which has little to do with the other nine. I'd like to read from the beginnings of three of the pieces. The first, called Spin Right and Shoot Left, is an attempt to describe a sport. You're on defense, zone defense. You pick up a loose ball and look for the outlet pass. You see it, throw it, and go down the middle on a fast break, taking the return pass. Now you're looking for a three-on-two or a two-on-one before they can get up, set up their defense. Too late. They're settled, man-to-man. -man. You're still looking for a two-on-one, but it's more complicated. You see and sense everybody, where they are, where they're headed, and as things develop, in almost constant motion. You watch for a backdoor cut and for someone posting up. Maybe go for an outside shot. The coach is yelling his mantra, look for the open man. There is no open man. Wary of a double team, you give up the ball with a bounce pass. One player to the next, the ball moves two, three, four times before you set a pick, roll, take a no-look pass, and go to the hoop for a layup. Are you playing basketball? No. You could be, of course, every term and move alike. But this is lacrosse, which is essentially the same game, an assertion that loses a good deal of its novelty in the light of the fact that James Naismith, best known for inventing basketball in 1891 and writing and publishing basketball's original rules in 1892, was a lacrosse player. A Canadian, he had played lacrosse in the 1880s at McGill and also for the New York Lacrosse Club. My goal in this piece was not only to describe the incredible beginnings, the incredible burgeoning of the game in recent years. 15,000 lacrosse players in Japan. Now, half a million lacrosse players in the United States but also to describe the game for people who know almost nothing about it. In that respect, an unusual structural opportunity developed in Ireland. While I was on a post-season trip with the Princeton men's lacrosse team, of which I am faculty fellow, <laughs> an official position not unlike shaman, that was thought up some years ago by the university's athletic director, Gary Walters, who can think up just about anything. There's a very strong component of luck in gathering material for nonfiction writing. When you come upon factual nuggets or useful situations that just arise as you go along, here is what happened in Ireland. In Dublin, most went to the Guinness factory the Guinness Brewery, some visited the Book of Kells, and I missed the bus to the lacrosse game. One moment, two buses were waiting at Jury's Inn Christchurch, and the lobby was a sea of orange and black equipment bags and uniformed players. I went up to my room for something I'd forgotten, and when I returned, the lobby was vacant and the buses were gone. I had nothing on paper that said where the game was to be, and I don't text message anybody. So I was curious when I uh, heard you reading about the fact checkers, how they responded to it. And if, I mean, one thing that strikes me is it is part of the magazine that's all, you know, it's below generally, you know, outside of the, of the public and outside of the story. I, actually, I had a story recently where I mentioned I was writing about a town that had been destroyed and all the people moved out. And I said that two people had wept to me while talking about this town. Um, and then the fact checker called and somebody else wept to the fact checker. Um, and so I tried to put that in the story in parentheses that they even wept to a fact checker and they didn't, that wouldn't fly. So I'm it curious, was, what was the reaction? Was this? Well, the first reaction was, I, I don't think David, David Remnick is the editor of The New Yorker and he also happens to be a former student of mine. So he, he's his boss and he's my boss. I, I don't think David was terribly enthusiastic about running a piece about, about that was so intramural, you know. And so he, he had it scheduled at one point, and then he took it off. And he said, I think this would go better in the anniversary issue, which sort of would excuse it. And I said, I, I think you're right. And so that was the sort of general uh, reaction within the fact-checking department. 
uh, there was a whole lot of stuff about all kinds of other fact-checking stories that, that it went down very well, as uh, far as I know. Everything from soup to nuts, including Dusty, uh, one of the fact-checkers, uh, Dusty Mortimer Maddox had, had a fur-covered telephone. <laughs> <laughs> In that piece you read about, you know, this sort of really amazing and fascinating fact that fortunately got checked. I mean, can you think of, are there any that got away that you can think of any very striking, very in integral parts of pieces, things that- Yes, I, I mean, it, that, indeed, over and over again, the, the, the really good story, or you thought it was really good, it goes away. And uh, offhand, I mean, I, I can't think of just one, but, uh, Josh Hirsch, with whom I worked for five years or something when he was fact-checking, was always apologetic about things like that. He, oh, I'm so sorry to do this to you, you know, killing some line in my story. He said, you know, Josh, there's only one thing worse than having that, losing that line, and that is having it in the story and, and being wrong, you know. I mean, he's saving me. And that, that, that's happened over and over again through the years. 